and we're kind of hitting a new level today. Expanding our horizons, you could Big say. Big time. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the first time ever in Fox 10 Talks history, I believe, correct yes. me if I am wrong, mm -hmm. we have a Harvard professor here to talk to us about some pretty yes. cool stuff. Yes. Take it away. And not just any Harvard professor. We're talking about Avi Loeb. Avi, thank you for joining us. Now, his research has been pretty groundbreaking and I know very, very raising eyebrows of uh, what the implications might be. But uh, of course, 2017, there was, I believe, Avi, please correct me, but the first interstellar object uh, that was confirmed, uh, Oumuamua, uh, that of course had the scientific community very chatting about what could that be. But there's a new object that was discovered July 1st, 31 Atlas, it is called. And it's the size of Manhattan, seven miles across, right? Uh, hurling towards space. In your theory, I know in a paper, talking about what the possibilities could be. Please, sir, tell us about Take it that. away. Right. So, I, you know, we are often frustrated by what happens here on Earth. And I'm trying to say, <clears throat> let's look up and maybe we'll have some uplifting news. <laughs> uh, and in this case, uh, you know, it's the third object discovered from outside the solar system um, that is uh, heading our way. Uh, and uh, as soon as it was discovered on the 1st of July uh, 2025, I realized that it must be quite big, as you pointed out. And if it's a, a rock, it's just too big to be real because uh, uh, there is not enough material in interstellar space to deliver a rock of that size, 20 kilometers or so, uh, every few years. And um, uh, therefore, it's probably much smaller, less than a kilometer or a mile uh, in, in diameter, uh, in which case it must be surrounded by a cloud of dust. That would be a comet. But then I realized in a paper that I wrote with two uh, colleagues uh, that, uh, in fact, it's moving on a very special trajectory. It's uh, aligned with the orbit of the Earth around the sun. There is a special plane that uh, it's aligned with. The chance for that happening at random is 0.2%, very small. But then even along that path, that it's moving, uh, it will. It has several interesting, uh, uh, you know, coincidences. For example, it will arrive closest to the sun when the Earth is on the opposite side of the sun. So the the sun will actually eclipse it. We won't be able to observe it. It's coming in the opposite direction to the motion of the Earth around the sun. So we won't be able to launch any hmm. uh, rockets that would intercept it because it would move three times faster than our best rockets. Uh, it also will come extremely close to Jupiter, Mars, and Venus. Uh, the chance of that happening is one in 20,000 uh, if you r randomly uh, uh, arrange for an arrival time. So the arrival time is very well selected. And also it's coming from the direction of the center of the Milky Way galaxy where there are lots of stars in that region of the sky. So it was difficult to detect it. That's why we found it only in July this year. Uh, and at this point, we can't intercept it from Earth. And the question is, was this uh, trajectory designed? Uh, because the chance of it having all these coincidences is really small. We will find out if uh, in the coming month or two, it doesn't look like a comet, doesn't have a plume of dust and gas around it. I would start getting worried. And then, you know, when it gets closest to the sun, that's the best place for a spacecraft to slow down with the help of the gravity from the sun. And uh, if we don't see it coming from the other side of the sun as expected, the stock market may crash. Hmm. <laughs> well, uh, Professor, I mean, so many things go through my mind. So, so we're saying there may be a possibility that there's intelligent life moving this object our way. I remember being in college and first hearing someone, a professor, say, you know, it's pretty... Um, it's 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 pretty arrogant for us to think that we are the only living creatures in the universe. What what are your thoughts on uh, other beings being out there and then being able to get to our solar system to check us out? I mean, is is that completely science fiction in your mind, or or maybe not so much? No, I, I, I actually, frankly, I don't like science fiction. I enjoy doing science, which is. <laughs> Let's look at the evidence. And, you know, one important fact is that we are late to the party. 
the sun formed in the last one third of cosmic history. Most stars in the Milky Way galaxy formed billions of years before the sun. Now you may ask, where will Voyager, the spacecraft that we launched out of the solar system, where will it be in a billion years? Mm. The answer is it will be on the opposite side of the Milky Way. So that there was plenty of time. If you started the clock billions of years before it started on Earth, there was plenty of time for their technological gadgets to reach us. And we had only one century of science since quantum mechanics was discovered. Only one century. They may have had the benefit of millennia or even millions of years or maybe even billions of years of uh, knowing much more about technology and science. And so we shouldn't assume anything. You know, when there is a blind date with uh, someone from another star, all bets are off. And we should be humble and just consider the data and learn more. And of course, if it looks like this one is a comet or an asteroid, that uh, makes, uh, then uh, we shouldn't uh, lose too much sleep about it, but we should check each and every new interstellar object that comes our way. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, in the coming decade, there is a new observatory that was founded funded by uh, the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy that we, that is starting operations in Chile called the Rubin Observatory. It will discover every few months a new interstellar object. And my recommendation is to keep our eyes open. In fact, I do think that, you know, in the past, we worried about existential threats from artificial intelligence, from uh, the change of the climate, or from uh, an asteroid that will impact the Earth. But there is another item that we should add mm. to the list, which is alien tech. I want to talk about that real quick, if we could, Professor. Now, you mentioned in your paper that if it is the case that this is a technological uh, artifact from an active intelligence, then there are two possibilities that follow. Can you talk about those possibilities? Right. There are two possibilities that bracket the range of everything that could happen. They are either friendly or hostile. Hmm. Um, and we should be careful because, um, you know, uh, as we know from the story that of the uh, Trojan horse, they may look friendly, but then there would be something else behind the, their intent to visit us. So I would be quite concerned. I think um, there is a need to establish a, a risk scale similar to the Richter scale for earthquakes, uh, where a zero would be a natural object. If we see a cometary tail, it looks like a comet. Forget about it. It's not risky. Uh, a, a 10 would be an object that maneuvers, that has propulsion, definitely has an engine, or it looks uh, very strange in its shape, or it produces artificial lights. Um, you know, that uh, should raise the alarm. And of course, there should be an organization that discusses how to respond to that, because we're dealing with a visitor that comes to our backyard. It's not a radio signal from thousands of light years away where we have plenty of time to think about how to respond. Here, you have a visitor, you have to decide what the intent of the visitor is. And, you know, it could be a threat to the future of humanity. Uh, so we need policymakers. We need also psychologists that will communicate the message to the public without creating any panic. My hope is similar to President Reagan's uh, hope uh, that it will bring people together when there is an external threat of that nature. But it could also uh, create uh, a lot of um, chaos because <clears throat> the uh, people will feel that they're not protected by the government uh, the way they are from adversarial nations. Mm. And we just have to look at human history and every time some human being has gone to another area or invaded another land mass, things really haven't probably gone well for the indigenous people who were there originally. So is that kind of the theory? And and and, and would there be a way, if, if they are so advanced that they can get here from wherever they came from, would your guess be, Professor, that we could somehow defend ourselves? Or, or, or there's or, no or, hope. <laughs> or, or, no, or, no. If 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 they're hostile, the experience will be very similar to the Iranian air defense uh, when the B two bombers showed overhead. Wow. Uh, but um, um, <clears throat> the question is whether they care about us. You know, it might well be the case that we do not count. I mean, we tend to think that we are very significant 
in the cosmic scheme of things. Uh, that's why we thought at first that we are at the center of the universe. And it took a while for the Vatican to revise that view. And, uh, you know, it took 350 years after Galileo died for them to admit that he was right. But um, not only that we are not at the physical center of the universe, we might not be at the intellectual center of the universe. There might be a smarter kid on the block. And um, as to the intent for them visiting us, I'm not sure. There is one solution to the paradox that was posed by Enrico Fermi when he asked, where is everybody? Right. And that solution is the dark forest hypothesis where, you know, there are plenty of them out there, but they're silent because they're worried about predators. And when they see us, a young technological civilization, gaining uh, capabilities that may um, risk them, that may threaten them, they might visit us. And until then, we will know that they are around the corner. You know, it's it's really difficult even to see a spacecraft that is tens of kilometers in size. It's impossible to see it when it's at, at a distance larger than 10 times the Earth-Sun separation. It, it, it doesn't reflect much uh, sunlight. Um, and only when it gets to within 10 times the Earth-Sun separation, we start seeing it with our best telescopes. So who knows what lies out there? We just um, have to look at the evidence. And, you know, I suggest... Uh, keeping our eyes on the ball, in this yeah. case, mm -hmm. interstellar yeah. objects. <laughs> Pro <laughs> Professor, we have about a minute left. I wanted to ask you real quick uh, if you could maybe offer a recommendation. Uh, if we see this object, we're getting closer to it. What should be the first communications that human beings should have with this object if it is another intelligence? You know, my recommendation to people who go on a blind date is <laughs> first, you need to listen. Don't speak, just listen to the other side. And that's the approach we should take because our imagination is limited to what we had here on earth. But you know, when dealing with a, a blind date uh, from yeah. another star, all bets are off. So Professor, should... all bets are off. <laughs> Fa yeah. Sorry to cut you off. We, we just ran out of time, but I, I am mm. so grateful for your, uh, your uh, thoughts on this. And yeah, I'm gonna look up at the sky a little differently from now on. That's for sure. Thanks for having me. Professor, okay. great stuff. Professor, Have a great oh, day. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. We'll be right back.